All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Yo, I'm doing this um, just to kind of get in preparation for um, my trip to Dragon Con tomorrow. The conference um, started yesterday or last night. Yesterday, you know, Thursday. And, it, and then um, there's a lot of people there that had the Wakanda Forever Party. And um, today is full day of panels and everything. And um, there's a couple of things I like to say about going to conventions and putting this convention into perspective. Um, there's like two, re three reasons. And the third reason is like tied into the first two, but it is a separate reason. Um, three, three reasons why I go to conventions. Uh, one, to um, sell my books, meet my fans, do business, right? That's main. That, you know, to me, that's like the most important. If I don't get anything else and I can go and sell books and, um, and meet fans and talk to people, shoot, I'm there, right? Um, if it's a, it's a convention where it's not that possibility, then, you know, hey, I might slow roll. Um, second reason is to go and network and business, you know, and uh, meet people that I only have, I'm only friends with on Facebook who are also in the industry. Um, I may meet agents that can take me further, um, things like that. So I've gone to conventions where it wasn't a chance for me to even make money, you know, but I went to, to, to promote myself and, you know, I gave away books, I made, traded, I networked and stuff like that. So, um, and then there's conventions where those two things are tied in and sometimes one outdoes the other so I can win-win. Um, and that was like Black Tasticon. I went there in June and, um, you know, I thought it was going to be a bigger business opportunity, but it came out that the um, networking opportunity was even bigger. So I did sell some books, but the networking was like, wow. And, you know, to be honest, you know, it, it may not be a slush pile for writers in the comic book industry um, and in the sci-fi industry, which is the literary industry, but um, meeting people certainly helps you um, get to the top of the pile, gets you ahead in, in, in many regards. So, um, you know, going and networking, you can't disvalue that, you know. Um, and then the third one is um, fanning out and being, uh, you know, I, 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 uh, I do like comic books. I wasn't into it that much when I was a child, but, you know, just to see the excitement, you know, I get inspired by ideas um, that people are doing and they, that they have out there. So especially in the world of black sci-fi, I like to look at what other people are doing because it inspires me. Um, then, you know, when I go to the mainstream conventions, I feel the same thing. You know, I see inspiration from independents and even the majors because I'm getting an idea of what they're doing. So, but there's, it's very rare that I'm going to go to a convention just for perusing the aisles. I mean, you got to be across the street for me to, for me to just say, oh, I'm going to go to this because I'm going to always feel, damn, why ain't I selling my books? You know what I'm saying? And I'm always going to try to meet people. So those first two are like, fit, you know, amazing, you know, very, very important to me. Um, so like with Dragon Con, um, it's interesting because um, it's too far. It's a flight. And second reason, it's a family weekend. I got family reunion that happens every year on Labor Day. So that becomes a hard one to go to because you gotta, you know, family is important and they don't do anything. They don't do something every weekend. So, um, and then like the third thing is the tables are like really expensive. They don't have a artist alley like a lot of other conventions have where you can get a table for like $100, $150. And so that becomes a pain in the behind because you know, this good networking, I always regarded Dragon Con as one of my favorite, my model for panels and, and how they do things. And they still have a top model. They still are better than every other convention except for maybe Comic Con. And But Wakanda Con is like right next to it because Wakanda Con did, you know, socially conscious um, panels. And Dragon Con, although they do like uh, vampires 
paranormal and horror, then they may do space, and they may do apocalypse. Um, they divide up their tracks like that and do like whole day and focus on it. You can get a lot out of it. Um, I don't know if they do anything as as exciting as the uh, Wakanda Cons um, panel where they bring in, you know, social activists who talk about the importance of, you know, literacy in our community for black people. That's real specific. So it's really hard. But, you know, I've been at com um, panels at Comic Con where they've talked, they've had librarians talk about the importance of of young adults. So let's not think that, you know, black people is the only ones that have these things. So anyway, um, why I decided to go to, to, to Dragon Con, and I, I dragged my feet. I felt that, you know, it was too, I'd been too much, and I had not, um, uh, what do you call it, really... I met everybody that I felt I could meet there, right? I think that's the bottom line. And um, I don't know if the industry comes there in any different fashion than they go to the so the MegaCon or Florida SuperCon that I have down here. So for me, if it ain't Comic Con or New York Comic Con, I'm going to sell. I want to have a table and I want to sell my books. And um, Dragon Con, I was not going to go because my family thing. And I was just like, yo, I'll make money at other conventions. I'll do my family. So it just so happened that, you know, they are embroiled in this uh, diversity push, this comic gate in a small regard. Not that they did anything in particular to perpetuate the comic gate, but they um, are affected by people who are vested in it. And so they... Uh, last time I went, they had um, Larry Carrera, who is uh, one of the sci-fi writers who was a part of the sad puppies thing and, and this pushback on diversity in science fiction. So they brought him and people was like, yo, I ain't, I ain't messing with Dragon Con. You know, I'm going to put pressure on Dragon Con to kind of renege his invitation. So same thing happened this year. They, they invited, uh, I think, a John Ringo who is Larry's writing buddy. They all insane, you know. Um, I mean, I have had, you know, my issues. I actually met them both, you know, um, and I'm, I'm down to debate them. But, you know, they have a hardline Republican, you know, in this divided country that we're in. Yo, it, writers are people, and they just are people that have different politics. So, um, some people withdrew. So, Dragon Con has had that. So I think in light of that, they tried to compensate and they created a diversity panel or diversity track. And I'm excited about that. When I heard it, I was like, oh my God, the diversity track. I think the announcement um, came out right in June. Um, they got the uh, gentleman Jarvis Sheffield, who is um, the founder of uh, the Black Science Fiction Society online group and the Facebook group. And he's, he's heading it up. And I was like, all right, well, now I changed my plans. It's too late to get a, um, a table. This is like June, but, you know, it's not too late to attend. So uh, he was able to get me um, um, on a couple of panels. So I'm there, you know, and, uh, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, re I'm ready, ready to go. But then when I saw the rest of the panels, I'm thinking this is like a Wakanda contract. I'm thinking, oh, hallelujah, right? They, um... Uh, what you call it, Dragon Con is in the future, but then I look at it and I'm like, damn it, you know, um, all the other causes are piled in. So it's like, when when we say diversity in New York, New Jersey, we mean racial diversity. Stop playing, you know, it is what it is, you know, we tired of being tokens, we pushing this. So there's also um, gender diversity. All right, we need some women. I'm not hating on women. I have more, most of my characters, my lead characters in my books are women, so I'm down with women, so I was like, you know, we're all right, but then they throw in the LBGT community, which again, I ain't homophobic, I don't have no problems with them, but now that's another issue that I think is very similar, because they're disenfranchised too, um, they, you know, they have some of the same issues that the black community have. But now, instead of them having their own track, and women having their own track, could have three tracks, we have to share one diversity track. 
And I'm like, oh man, you're killing me. You know what I'm saying? Um, and we don't want to say black track because black sometimes people use that as an excuse to act like it is not welcoming to others. You know what I'm saying? So it just became awkward like that. It felt like, oh my God, now, you know, our voice is um, diluted. You know what I'm saying? Our intentions are diluted. And um, I'm, I'm, you know, I feel indifferent about it. So I'm still going to attend. Um, of course, I bought my plane ticket. I ain't wasting $160. Um, but I am going with more of my my um, reason, I guess, three element, and I'm going to fan out. I'm also looking forward to the people that I will meet. Um, the Barneses, <laughs> I don't even think they're related, but Stephen Barnes, um, sci-fi writer, is a guy that I like to listen to and talk to, and is going to be there. He's actually going to be on some of the diversity panels. He's a diversity track guest. And then um, my man, I've been blowing his whistle all last few months, Rodney Barnes, the author of Falcon and, and Lando, he's going to be there. Now, if, if if David Walker was there, the writer of um, Luke Cage, it would be like a triathlon, you know? So I'm going to network with those people. I have some questions that I want to have answered, so I wrote some of them down. Oh, other people that I'm looking forward to. I just found out one of my comedians is going to be there, Leanne Lord. And um, that's cool because I always knew that there was an opportunity for comedians to do some um, work, you know, shows at comic conventions, specifically black comedians, because they've had white comedians. But I was like, you know, I'm all, I am I started as an agent, you know, for comedians. So I have that big element. So my girl, um, Leanne Lord, is going to be there. And then William Hatashi. He's the host of the... Um, Black Science Fiction Society's radio show. He's going to be there. So um, uh, I'll, I'll have some good networking. I actually want to exchange books with him because last time we was at, in Boston, and he didn't have his books with him. So I hope he brought his books. But um, the three questions I want to have answered, and I'm going to sit down to whoever, people in the audience, if I, you know, other people, because it's Atlanta, there's a lot of black sci-fi writers. So I want to have a little powwow, and I want to find out where is this black audience at? These people made Black Panther billions of dollars or whatever, a billion dollars, 700,000, um, 700 million. Where are they? Are they coming to black sci-fi writers? Are they coming to black comic book? Are they, you know, what? where is the rush? All right. And then, um, of course, if the rush is there, we're not attracting them. Then I want to know, should we have a black section in the comic book stores. I mean, um, it's like saying, do we need an urban section in the black bookstores? Urban bookstores sp propped up and they, they've they been making money. So um, we could have used that. So are we going to not have a black sci-fi or a black comic book section in comic book stores and we just go separate but equal and have black comic book stores? That may happen. It's already there. I don't know. Um, and then... Um, you know, I've been talking about this, and I think this this element right here is a good question. Is um, oh, what's up with the urban stories? You know, um, do they threaten um, black writers who have a problem with hip hop, who have a problem with young uh, black people? Um, these, you know, I'm 51, so like you're older than me in New York. You kind of had a beef with hip hop. You know what I'm saying? You thought hip hop was for kids. You know, if you're 54, 55, yo, you weren't a part of the hip hop generation. So you may have a problem. And a lot of black writers are older than 50 in different parts of the country and may still have a chip on their shoulders with, with urban stories. So that's 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 um my last one, because I, you know, of course, I want to do my Killmonger story. I'm pitching that. But also Blade is coming back. And I think Blade, because Wesley Snipes was so grounded, he had Amon Ra pictures. He's, you know, he's a part of the uh, the, the conscious community and the black community. I first time I met him was at uh, Dr. Jeffrey's lecture in New York at City College. Um, so I know he's woke, but you know how woke is Blade? And so in this post Black Panther era. You know, are we going to talk about Blade? Are we going to talk about the, you know, 
Blackening of Blade. I would love to write a Blade comic book, but you know, he ain't gonna just be fighting vampires and stuff like that. We're gonna deal with he got some superpowers. What you gonna do for the community like he did with Falcon when Rodney Barnes wrote him, like he did um I forget the lady's name, but how she wrote Blade and included him in um, Black Panther and the crew. So I think in this post-Black Panther era, we're going to have to probably deal with Blade's blackness. That's it, y'all. So those are some of the things I want to talk about. A little long, but I'm out.